Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into his grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering brings endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. About the uh, greatest command, he went to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, reminding them that the Lord their God was one, and they were to love the Lord their God with all their heart, with all their soul, and with all their might. When that passage gets quoted by a scribe in Mark chapter 12, he says that we shall love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. But even in the original context that I mentioned, Matthew chapter 22, uh, Jesus said that is the great commandment. And the second one is, is like it, quoting from Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says Deuteronomy 6 is the first and great commandment, and the second is much like it. I mentioned last week that the rabbis had identified 615 commandments within the law, 365 negative commandments and 248 positive commandments. I'm sure that the one who puts Jesus to the test in Matthew chapter 22 thought there, there's no way he can get this right. Whatever card he picks, I'm going to win this game. What could he choose out of 615 commandments that, that could not be challenged? that could not be undermined by, by some uh, slight of, of his, his cunning or in, in trying to entrap Jesus with his words. And yet Jesus identified Deuteronomy 6 and Leviticus 19 in, in saying if you get 613 of those 615 right and you miss these two, you've lost it all. You failed the test if you miss these two great commandments. And so obviously from the beginning, God had been instructing his people about love, about loving him and about loving one another. And so Jesus having answered his accusers and those who were sometimes genuinely questioning him in answering them this way, certainly it later raised some questions when he started talking about a new commandment that involved love. Verse 34 of John chapter 13, a new commandment I give you that you should love one another. I thought you'd already said that's an old commandment. That's the second great commandment. And then in chapter 15, verse 12, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. And that's what takes this to love 2.0. It's not that they hadn't been challenged to love before, not that they hadn't been instructed to love before, but now there's a new motivation, now there's a new model. Not love just in any way you want to, not love in such a way that reflects the standards of love that you find in this world, where pretty much love is reciprocated to those who show you love. Kindness and mercy and generosity and compassion are reciprocated to those who would show that to you. That's the kind of love that the world easily buys into. That's why Jesus said, you know, what, what credit is it to you? 
What reward do you have if you love those who, who love you? If you greet only, only your brothers? That's what the Gentiles do. That's what the tax collectors do. But he's giving us this new motivation, this new model for love. You love as I have loved you. And how I have loved you is first. Before the thought ever crossed your mind, before the decision ever became a dilemma for you as to whether or not you would love me in return, I loved you first. And that's what we saw at the end of the lesson last week in those passages from the letter of 1 John. Chapter 4, verse 10. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Chapter 4, verse 19 of 1 John. We love because... He first loved us. And in that way, God's love is like a parent's love for his or her child. God's love is like a father's love. God's love is even like a mother's love, according to Scripture. In Isaiah 49, verse 15, Can a woman forget her nursing child, that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? He says it's just natural. That, that a woman cannot forget her child. And he says, if there is a woman who could actually do that, don't think that God could fall prey to the same neglect. Even these may forget, Isaiah writes, but I will not forget you. The last chapter of Isaiah, looking forward to the restoration of Jerusalem by which God's people would be nourished, by which God's people would be sustained. Verses 12 and 13 of Isaiah 66, For thus, thus says the Lord, Behold, I will extend peace to her like a river, and the glory of the nations like an overflowing stream. And you shall nurse and shall be carried upon her hip and bounced upon her knees. As one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you. You shall be comforted in Jerusalem. I will comfort you just like a mother comforts her small hurting child. As Jesus was approaching Jerusalem and knowing what was about to transpire, knowing those who would hail him as the son of David and, and cry out, uh, Hosanna in the highest, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, quoting from Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, about this one who, this king who would enter, not in flashy fashion, but gentle, humble, mounted upon a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. Within a matter of a very few days, some of those same people would be, be crying out, crucify him. And knowing this and knowing the level of rejection that would take place in Jerusalem, he told them, I, I just want to gather you up. I want to, to just pull you close to me. Like a hen seeks to gather her brood under her wings. Like, like a female chicken in regard to her little ones wants to cover them with her wings and protect them and nurture them and spare them. That's the way I want to nurture and gather and spare you. That's descriptive of a mother's love. And scripture says that's descriptive of the way God loves us. We think of him most often as loving us with a father's love but we know also the blessing of a mother's love. And God says, whatever that means to you, whatever value you can find in that, know, you, know that I love you in that way. And it's a love that endures. I read a story about a, a mom who was concerned about her only son going off to college, and so, like moms sometimes do, she wrote a letter to the president of the university. That would be great, wouldn't it? You know, to, to have a letter to the president of the college precede you you know, your freshman year. But she said, Dear Sir, my son's been accepted for admission to your college and soon he'll be leaving me. I'm writing to ask that you give him your personal attention in the selection of his roommate. I want to be sure that his roommate is not the kind of person who uses foul language or tells off-color jokes or smokes or drinks or chases after girls. I hope you'll understand why I'm appealing to you directly. You see, this is the first time my son will be away from home except for the three years that he spent in the Marine Corps. <laughs> it doesn't matter how long you've been gone or where you've been gone, uh, that mother's love goes with you. 
and still wants to nurture and protect and, and to spare you from, from some things in this world that might do you harm, and that's how God loves us. A mother's love never fails. Our father's love never ceases. First John chapter 3, verse 1, See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God, and so we are. He describes his relationship to us in so many beautiful ways, but none more tender, none more moving than, than the idea of a parent with his children. It's been three weeks now since Dad's death, and I started looking at the calendar, thinking back to the time of Mom's passing. This is now my sixth Mother's Day since Mom passed away in 2010. This is my 26th Mother's Day since Kim became a mother to Hannah and later to Coleman. I loved my mother, but she loved me first. Hannah and Coleman loved their mother, but she loved them first. I'm convinced that we love God, but we need to be reminded that he loved us first. And that's how he wants us to love other people, first. Jesus says, you love as I have loved you. I loved you first. And so you love people in the same way. Before you even get to figure out how they're going to respond to you, what they're going to think of you, what they might say about you, how they might treat you, you go ahead and decide I'm going to love them, regardless of anything that, that happens after that. That's unconditional love. That's just like a parent's love for a child. From the time you find out you're going to have that child, you love that child. They haven't done anything. They haven't said anything. They haven't produced anything. They haven't accomplished anything. And your love for them has nothing to do with any of that. You love them because they exist. God loves us because we exist, because we are made in his image. He loved us from the time he created us. Love exists in relationship. A relationship as its object. I think that's why love is the greatest of those, faith, hope, and love. Beyond the fact that one of these days faith will become sight and hope will be realized and we won't need faith and hope anymore and love will endure, love is eternal because God exists in relationship as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Love has always existed in the nature of God. That's why 1 John can reveal to us that God is love. Not just when He created and was in relationship with his creation. Love has always been a part of the nature of God. And so his love for us is unconditional, meaning that it's not limited in any way. It's complete, it's absolute, it's unqualified. There's no stipulations, there's no quid pro quos. We talk about times of war when ultimately there is a victor and there is an unconditional surrender that is achieved. How many stipulations in an unconditional surrender? None, if it's an unconditional surrender. Sometimes, occasionally, you'll hear about uh, an unconditional guarantee, uh, an unconditional money-back guarantee. How many conditions on an unconditional money-back guarantee? That's why there aren't many of them, you know? There, there's always the, the fine print. There are always things that will bind conditions upon that supposed deal. The text that was read for us uh, by Nate before the lesson this morning from Romans chapter 5 describes God's unconditional love for us. Reminding us of the time when God sent his son to die for us, not when we loved him, but before we loved him. God shown, shows his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The way the world loves is with the clause, terms and conditions may apply. And terms and conditions often apply when it comes to the world's love. But not God's love. Terms and conditions. The young man expressed his affection for his love 
And he said, I'll climb the highest mountain for you. I'll swim the deepest ocean for you. I'll cross the widest desert for you. Nothing can keep me away from you. So I'll see you on Tuesday, my love. Unless, of course, it's raining. Or fill in the blank. Terms and conditions may apply. This world is, is full of terms and conditions. Life is full of terms and conditions. Things change. But it doesn't change God's love for us, and it shouldn't change our love for one another. And so he says, you, you love like I love. You love first. You love unconditionally. And he reminds us of, of the simple ways in which he does that. Matthew chapter 5, verse 45. Sun rose this morning on the righteous and the unrighteous. The rain falls on, on the evil and the good. He doesn't wait to see how they're going to respond to that blessing. He just sends it. So Jesus teaches in Luke chapter 6, th verses 35 and, and 36, love your enemies, not, as he says in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. You'll be like your Father, because He is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. The only way you can be kind to the ungrateful and the evil is unconditionally. Because if terms and conditions apply, their unkindness and their evil towards you will change your attitude toward them. They'll change your actions and your words toward them. As Paul's preaching in, in uh, Acts 14 in Antioch of Pisidia, he, he reminds these Gentiles of, of the blessings that God had always sent upon them. General blessings upon mankind unconditionally. He didn't leave himself without witness, but he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. And they continued to serve their idols. They continued to, to follow their pagan ways, and God keeps giving them bountiful rain and fruitful seasons. Jeremiah 31.3, God says through Jeremiah, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Psalm 36, verse 5, Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Psalm 106, verse 1, Praise the Lord, O give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever. And that's the kind of love that we are called to model as those created in His image, as those who are called to be holy as He is holy, as those who are called to love as He has loved. And it's hard to get our minds around, and, and it's challenging to conform our lives to. So as we close, I'd like for you to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 3. We'll start reading in verse 17. Actually, verse 16, Ephesians chapter 3. According to the riches of His glory, may He grant you to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Push yourself, stretch yourself to try to comprehend and embrace how high and how long and how broad and how deep God's love for us is and how broad and deep our love for one another should be. How deep the Father's love for us, we sang. How vast beyond all measure. In the coming weeks, we're going to be exploring ways in which we can love as we have been loved. Just like that mother, despite the fact that her son had been in the Marine Corps for three years, couldn't quite be, get beyond that, that notion of, of wanting to protect him and provide for him. That's, that's an unconditional love. 
And I love the unconditional love that's displayed in the, the parable of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. The father had to have been hurt. The father had to have felt dishonored and disrespected to have his younger son demand his inheritance and, and to leave the tents of his father. Don't know how long time scale in the parable he was gone. We know what he did with the inheritance. But what he had done did not change his father's love for him. The song we're about to sing is based on the, the parable of the prodigal son in, in Luke 15, beautifully, poetically, and, and musically expressed. And the last verse of that song says, See, my father waiting stands. See, he reaches out his hands. God is love. I know, I see. Love for me, yes, even me. Doesn't matter what where you've been, doesn't matter how long you've been gone, doesn't matter what you've done. God's love for you remains. God's desire for your salvation continues. If you need to return to his loving embrace this morning, if you need to make needs known and, and be embraced by the love of God's people, whatever your need might be, please make that known to our shepherds as we stand and sing this song together.